Well, good morning, Grace Road Church. So good to see you today on this beautiful sunny Sunday morning. Especially if this is your first time with us. Again, we're just so grateful that you've chosen to join us and worship with us today. Uh, Before we jump into the text, let's go ahead and pray. Can we do that? Let's pray. Father, again, we're just so grateful for the opportunity to be together once again. uh, To gather with other brothers and sisters in the gospel. To sing to you and for you and about you. To pray together to open your word together. But Lord, we really do recognize that one of the greatest opportunities we have is to come to you in prayer. Uh, Lord, we're thankful that we can do that individually. We're thankful we can do that corporately. We're, we're grateful that we have the opportunity whenever we'd like to come to you uh, with praise, to bring you thanksgiving, and to come to you with requests and supplications and that you're eager to hear them. And Lord, we're thankful that we can come to you even on the behalf of others. That we can intercede for them in their time of need. And, and as we open your word today in, in our passage, Lord, we see that, that not only do we have the great benefit of, of interceding for others and having others intercede for us, uh, we're grateful we have the incredible blessing that Jesus himself intercedes for us. And so, Lord, our prayer is this morning, Lord, would you help that truth encourage weary and fearful hearts today? Lord, would you strengthen our faith this morning? And so, Lord, we pray, God, Lord, would you bless our time in your word, that you would stir our hearts, renew our minds, and, Lord, that you would do all of it for your glory and our good. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let me invite your attention to Luke chapter 22 this morning. Luke 22. We're continuing in Luke's gospel here, and we're coming close to the end. Uh, But one of the most refreshing things about Scripture, when we're reading throughout the Bible is that it's deeply honest about life, right? Like, like when you read stories, well, again, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, uh, we just see that there's just no sugarcoating uh, what life is like for the people within its pages. Uh, I mean, even for the people that we would hold up as kind of heroes uh, for the faith, Scripture doesn't try to hide that even those people were deeply flawed, sinful individuals. And this is really refreshing for us. And it's not because, you know, we, we uh, want to take pleasure in or be entertained by, by the worst moments of someone's life. But it's because it just makes them more relatable to us, right? I mean, I, like, I can't relate to a king. I have no idea what that's like. Uh, but I can relate to a king's sinful desires and behaviors. Right? Like, it's hard to relate with people who literally spoke with God Never had that happen, but I can relate to their fears and doubts and hang-ups. It's really hard to relate to the disciples. I mean, these guys who, who walked and talked with Jesus. I mean, had meals with Jesus, saw the miracles happen. I can't relate to that, but what I can relate to are, are their shortcomings and their failures. Peter, one of the 12, certainly had his share, didn't he? That's who we're talking about this morning. Of the 12 disciples, Peter is the most well-known. He was the first to be called by Jesus to follow him. Peter walked on water with Jesus. He saw the transfiguration. He was the first to profess Jesus as the Christ. His profession, Jesus said, would be the foundation of the church. He, He was zealous. He was outspoken. He was a leader among leaders. Arguably, he probably was seen as like the most promising disciple of the bunch. But our passage this morning in Luke 22 focuses not on the highest moments of Peter's life, but actually the very lowest moment of his life when he denies Jesus. And this is a powerful scene. It's one that's hard to read. It's hard to imagine. But it's actually way more relatable than we'd like to admit. And again, it's difficult for us to read, and we can only imagine it's probably difficult for Peter too, because if you think about it, he's probably one of the sources for Luke's gospel. Luke is looking for eyewitnesses, and he goes to Peter, and, and Peter is just very honest. Yeah, I did. I denied Jesus. And when we talk about some of our failures, we kind of spin it a little bit. It's not as bad as it really was. But Peter, here's, he's got to say, no, this really happened. And not only am I telling you, but it's going to be in the Bible for all time. Everybody's going to know about this, right? And so it's difficult to read. I'm sure it's difficult to share. Uh, but there really are some very helpful and important lessons in this uh, story, in this passage. And what, 
excuse me, what I want to do is, is just point out three main lessons from this passage today. I want us to talk about the warning of Satan's attacks, the challenge to our witness, and the comfort of Christ's intercession today. So let's go ahead and pick up in Luke chapter 22, verse 31, just for the context. They're still in the upper room. They've observed the Passover meal, instituted the Lord's Supper. This is before they go out to the Mount of Olives where they're going to pray and Jesus is arrested. Okay, so verse 31. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, or, or Peter, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. I jump down to verse 54. They've since left the, uh, the upper room. Now they're in the garden. Verse 54. Then they seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also is with him, for he too is a Galilean, probably because of Peter's accent. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Again, this is the lowest moment for the most promising disciple of Jesus. Uh, but again, there's so much to glean from this. So let's just walk through this. Let's talk about, first of all, the warning of Satan's attacks. Look again at verse 31. When Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. Okay, a few things in that verse. Uh, that word you, that pronoun there in the original language is actually plural. In other words, he's saying, Peter, Peter, Simon, Simon, um, Satan demanded to have you all. All of you disciples, Satan wants you. Uh, but he says, but to you specifically, Peter, he, he wants Peter to especially to hear this. That Satan's demanding uh, his followers. And, and it was this warning. Again, Satan demanded to have you. He wanted to, to destroy you. He wanted to sift you like wheat. So he uses this analogy from harvesting wheat to, to describe Satan's desire uh, for the disciples. And if you're not a, a wheat farmer, which is probably no one in here. Uh, the process basically goes like this. That the wheat has to be sifted. has to be winnowed. It's this process of removing the chaff, the, the inedible part of the wheat from the grain. That's the good part, the part we can eat. And one of the ways that that was done is that after it was threshed, the farmer could take the wheat, could throw it in the air, and the wind would blow away the chaff, the, the bad part, and the good part, the grain would fall to the ground and they could gather it up. And this was an analogy that's used in other places in the gospel. If you, if you remember this, back in Luke chapter 3, John the Baptist, when he's preaching on the scene about Jesus coming and God's coming judgment, he uses the same terminology. Listen to Luke 3, verse 16. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. To clear his threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Here's John preaching. He says um, there, there's chaff, and, and in the picture are, are those who do not follow Christ. And, and so back in Luke 22, our passage this morning, Jesus is saying, guys, listen, Satan wants this of you. He wants to see you end up like chaff. He, he wants to see your faith destroyed. He wants to see that you're blown away at the judgment. And so he's saying, guys, this is real. This is a real threat to you. Uh, and by the way, this is a good reminder for us that Satan is real. 
that his threats are real. His desire has not changed. He desires to see more chaff than grain. Uh, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a lot of famous works, obviously, and one of them is called The Screwtape Letters. I'm sure many of you have, have read it. Uh, but if you haven't in it, uh, Lewis presents these letters uh, from a more senior demon named Screwtape written to a more junior demon named Wormwood. And, and Wormwood has this mission. He has one task, and it's to tempt this person away from Christ. And so it's these letters back and forth, and it's this fictionalized, of course, series of conversations uh, where Lewis is exploring what temptation's like and how to stand for him in your faith. But in the very last letter, we realize that, that Wormwood fails, that this person dies, and, and he's never tempted away from Christ, and he, he goes to heaven. In that last letter, uh, it's implied that Wormwood uh, was afraid that Screwtape, his mentor, his uncle, would be really upset at him. And he's like seeking affirmation that he still loves him. And this is what Lewis wrote in that last letter from Screwtape. It says, I've always desired you as you, pitiful fool, desired me. The difference is that I'm the stronger. He says, I think they'll give you to me now or a bit of you. Love you. Why, yes, as dainty a morsel as ever I grew fat on. He signs that you're increasingly and ravenously affectionate uncle, Screwtape. What Lewis is trying to portray in that fictionalized version is this biblical teaching that Satan is a ravenous being who has this pride-fueled mission to destroy as many people as possible. And that ravenous being was there in Jerusalem with the desire to destroy the, uh, the disciples of Jesus. And, and by the way, it's really easy when we read that passage to kind of come down on Peter like, Dude, how could you do this? Like of all times when Jesus is about to go to the cross, how could you deny Jesus? After all you did, after all you saw, you denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. But we have to remember it wasn't only his weakness, of the weakness of his flesh that, that Peter was battling, but a real uh, attack of Satan. And in fact, we can imagine that that experience left quite an impression on Peter. That he wants to go on and teach about. This was an unforgettable lesson. And so listen to what he would write later on in life in 1 Peter chapter 5. He's writing to these, these Christians experiencing persecution. And verse 8 he says, be sober minded. Be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You can imagine Peter penning this letter, saying, let, let me tell you, the devil's real. Satan's real. And he wants to sift you like wheat. He wants to see you destroyed. He wants to pull you away from Christ. So, so, so resist him. Stand firm in your faith. And I think we don't really talk about Satan a whole lot. We don't talk about demons and spiritual warfare very much. Um, we, all, you know, we all face the same enemies. The Bible teaches the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we talk a lot about the world, certainly. We talk a lot about our flesh, certainly. But we don't talk a lot about uh, Satan too much. And, and I think probably it's because we just really don't really know that much about him. Or we're kind of nervous that maybe our conversation will take a really weird turn uh, about what we think is going on or what's happening. Or we don't want people to think we're weird because we're talking about these kind of strange supernatural things. But we need the reminder sometimes that, that, that this was true in the first century. And this is true in the 21st century. That Satan desires your fall. He, he's our real enemy. He's the true enemy who will stop at nothing to see that you and I are sifted like wheat. And, and so we should be aware of him. We should uh, re recognize he's a very real threat on the church as a whole. He's a very real threat on us individually as Christians. Um, and so much so Paul would say this to the church at Ephesus. He's, he's writing to these believers, telling these incredible truths about the gospel. This is what it means to live in the gospel. Finishing up his letter, in chapter 6, verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He's saying, guys, don't forget 
that we don't wrestle flesh and blood. That there's real spiritual warfare. That, the Satan, that Satan desires you. He demands of you. That he wants to destroy you. He said, you can't afford to ignore this reality. Stand firm. You have to be watchful. Resist him. Be strong in the Lord. Put on the whole armor of God. The armor of scripture and faith and righteousness. And, and he goes on to say in the rest of chapter 6. And, and so here's Peter. He, he's facing an attack by Satan. We face these threats as well. It's good for us to remember that. To be reminded of that. But the scene also challenges our witness. Now, here's what I mean by that. Imagine being in the upper room. Jesus is speaking to Peter, looks him right in the eye and says, listen, Peter, Satan demands you. He's a real threat. He wants you to be destroyed. He wants to sift you like wheat. Now, if I'm Peter, my hope would be that I believe him. That, that I believe Jesus, that if anybody knows what Satan wants, it's going to be Jesus. And so I should probably listen to him. But it seems like Peter doesn't. Like he's not heeding this warning. Right? He's, not, he's not really concerned about Satan's attack on him. In fact, he confidently declares, yeah, I'm never going to turn away from you. In fact, just the opposite. He says, Lord, I'm prepared to go to prison with you tonight. Like, I'll, I'll go to the cross with you today. And to Peter's credit, you know, he really did follow Jesus after his arrest, albeit the text says, from a distance. But the other disciples weren't there. Here's Peter trying to follow Jesus. He's trying to make good on his claim that he was with Jesus until the end. But then he gathers around a fire. He's with other people who don't follow Jesus. And he's confronted three times. First a servant girl, then two different men during the evening recognize Peter and say, wait, aren't, aren't you? Aren't you with that guy? Like, like, don't you follow him too? And of course Peter says, nope. I don't know who you're thinking of, but it ain't me. I have no idea who that guy is. And, and when we read that story, if we're honest with ourselves, man, we can relate to this far more than we'd like to admit. Right, like think about it. How many times have you been around your Christian friends, Christian family? You've had a great discussion about Jesus you talked about the gospel, your faith. You spent time in prayer together. Talked about the church, the faith community. And then you go around non-Christian. Whether that's colleagues or other friends or other family. And Jesus never comes up. Or if he does come up, you find yourself timid or embarrassed or afraid to say anything at all. I mean, we've all been there. Right? And the reason is, it's just far easier to follow Jesus when we're surrounded by other followers of Jesus. And it's much harder to follow Jesus when we're surrounded by opponents of Jesus. We all know that to be true. So again, think about Peter's life. All the incredible things he's done. Again, walked on water. Uh, made this profession of Jesus as the Christ. All of these moments in his faith journey, every time he was with Jesus and with the disciples. But now Jesus is gone and all the other disciples have fled and he's all alone. Except he's around a campfire facing glares and accusations by people who don't follow Christ. And he folds. Right? The hard truth is one of the greatest tests of our commitment to Christ is when we're around those who reject Christ. And when we're around the campfire, so to speak, again, whether at your office or at school or even within your own home, we will either embrace the cross of Christ or we will avoid the cross of Christ. And Peter made the choice, I'm going to avoid the cross of Christ here. And we do the same thing. I mean, out of fear of being seen as naive or archaic or bigoted or narrow-minded or gullible, we just deny knowing and loving Christ. And by the way, that can be done a number of different ways. It can be just outright saying, no, I don't follow Jesus. I'm not a Christian, just like Peter did there in Luke 22. Or we can be silent when it comes up in conversation. Or we can try to make Jesus a little bit more palatable by changing his controversial teachings. Right? So, for example, in our cultural moment, like it's somewhat easy to follow Jesus in the public sphere until, that is, the topics of gender roles, sexuality, or the exclusivity of Christ for salvation come up. Then it's way harder. 
And so what happens is to ease that difficulty, some will try to say, yeah, I follow Jesus, uh, but not necessarily all of his teachings in Scripture. Right? And the truth is, again, we're all Peter at some time. We gather with the church, we gather with our grace group, we have an amazing time, and then we go out and at the first sign of opposition, our demeanor changes. Like we're bold one moment and then we're afraid the next. In those moments, when we fail to acknowledge Jesus, Jesus stands alone like he did there at the campfire. I mean, imagine that, that scene in Luke 22 Peter's just boldly declared, oh, Jesus, I will go, I will be arrested with you. I will go to death with you. He denies it of all times while Jesus is under arrest. I mean, Jesus is really going to the cross. And Peter bailed. And we do the same thing. But followers of Jesus are called to follow Jesus. And even when following him takes us to the place of the cross. And listen to how the author of Hebrews describes this. In Hebrews chapter 13, he's writing in his letter here towards the end. He says in verse 12, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that's to come. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that... Acknowledge his name. What's he saying there? He's saying, you remember how Jesus went to the cross? Like you remember how he endured the reproach at his arrest and his trial and his crucifixion? You remember how he was, you know, taken outside the city where despised things, where despised people are taken? Followers of Jesus go there. And we go there because Jesus is there. And he's saying, I would rather be outside the camp with Jesus than inside the camp without him. We follow him even to the cross. And notice how the author says there that, that, that he reminds them that we have no lasting city here. We, we seek the city that's to come. And, and he's drawing out this idea we, we should have this really healthy detachment uh, of this world. Because we recognize, no, we have a true eternal home who's to come with Christ our Savior. And as we grow in that and as we recognize that and that settles in our heart and mind, it becomes a lot easier to really hold the opinions of other people very loosely. It becomes a lot easier to welcome the reproach of this world because our eyes are fixed on Christ, the one who's outside the camp. That walk to outside the camp becomes a lot shorter and easier. But here probably the most powerful moment of this account is that when the rooster crows, Luke tells us, Jesus, who's nearby, looks at Peter. They lock eyes. If you can only imagine that moment. And Peter's shattered. I mean, think about that. You might know that feeling too. Where you walk away from that conversation, you walk away from that situation, and you think, man, I failed. I could have said something. I could have said something different. And I blew it. I wasn't faithful to Jesus who's so faithful to me. And that's so encouraging to say, dis discouraging to say the least, right? It's discouraging to be so on fire for Jesus one moment, only to have that fire extinguish the very next. We know, again, Jesus has done so much for us. He's gone to great lengths for us. And then here we are, and we can't even have a conversation about him. Right? Between Satan's attacks, between our weakness, we stumble. We're Peter here in this passage. But there's also some really good news in this passage. And it's that our perseverance is not ultimately up to us, but it's up to the one who saved us in the first place. Notice with me the comfort of Christ's intercession in this passage. Look again at verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. So here, he's Jesus, he's looking at Peter, and he said, listen, Satan is demanding you, but he has to go through me first. And his demand is countered by Jesus' intercession. And notice, Jesus is saying, Peter, this is going to be a, a, a tough night for you, a, a tough day, um, but you will turn again. Like, you ultimately won't fail. And when you do turn again, strengthen your brothers. I have a ministry for you. I want you to do something. He says, this is going to happen because I prayed for you. I interceded for you. 
And the amazing truth that the Bible presents to us is that Jesus has also prayed for you. And he continually prays for you as well. In fact, in John 17, this is in John's gospel, he records this conversation that we don't have in Luke's gospel, that while they're in the upper room, before they go out, Jesus prays for his disciples. And he prays for a number of things, but, but part of his prayer for the disciples was that the Father would keep them and that none of them other than Judas would be lost. And he goes on to pray this in John 17, verse 15. He says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. In other words, he's acknowledging Satan wants them, but Father, would you keep them? I want to pray for them. Would you guard their faith? Make their salvation real and certain and sure. But then he goes on to pray this in verse 20. Notice this. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So not only these guys in this room, but all my disciples from here on out. Father, I pray, would you guard them from the evil one? Would you preserve them? Like, like understand, in the upper room, Jesus prayed for you. And this prayer has been called the high priestly prayer. And the reason it's called that is because when Jesus is praying for his disciples, he's, he's acting like a high priest. And, and to understand that, we kind of have to understand the priests in the Old Testament. So, so follow along with me here. It was the priest's job uh, to serve in the tabernacle, later serve in the temple. Uh, and that's the place where God dwelled among his people. And, and this priest would act as the mediator between the people and the Lord. And so he had various duties one of them being offering sacrifices on behalf of the people. And he did that all year long. But there was one very significant day of the year called the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, uh, the high priest, he, he would enter into the section of the temple that was called the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place, into the presence of the Lord. And to enter, we, we can read in the Old Testament, the, pre, the high priest had to do all kinds of different things. It was a ritual. He had to wear a certain coat. He had to bathe. He had to bring incense. He had to sprinkle blood seven times on the mercy seat and altar. Uh, it was a process. Um, but in Exodus 28, there's this great description about specifically what he had to wear when he went into the Holy of Holies. And in Exodus 28, it tells us that the high priest wore this uh, breast piece, this, this, uh, this clothing, and on it, were written the names of the sons of Israel. In other words, he would go on behalf of his people into the presence of the Lord. He was the mediator. And then that day they would sacrifice a goat for the sins of the people. They'd pray and send away another goat to symbolize how those sins had been removed from them. But the point is, is part of that day was the high priest going beyond the curtain into the presence of God bringing the names of the people of, before God. Now, now catch what the author of Hebrews says about Jesus, who's our ultimate high priest. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Now, the point in what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest. One who's seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. In other words, the author's saying, remember all the priests that we, we know and have been told about for years and centuries in Israel, all of those have been pointing to Jesus, the true, better, ultimate high priest. And he's the perfect high priest because he's made the perfect sacrifice once for all. He's entered into the presence of the Father and he's seated at the right hand of the throne. And I think what happens is it's easy to read that and think, well, it kind of sounds like Jesus is done. And he's gone to heaven and he's kind of like sitting back with his feet propped up, just kind of waiting to the day that, that you know, he's called back to duty. And he comes and returns and makes all things new. But notice how he goes on to describe Jesus. Verse 2. He says, a minister in the holy places. In the true tent that the Lord set up, not men. Your, your translation might say serving in the sanctuary. He's a minister in the holy places. In other words, he's saying, listen, Jesus right now acts as a minister. Right now he serves in the sanctuary. He continues to be the ultimate high priest, serving in the presence of the Lord. So understand, his ministry is not complete. Now it's just based on his perfect sacrifice. 
He continues to serve his people. He continues to intercede on our behalf. And, and so we'll read other verses like this. Hebrews 7, 25. The author says, Consequently, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He lives for this. This is what he does. Paul would say in Romans 8, verse 34, Who's to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Again, recognize like Jesus in the upper room, the night of his arrest, prayed for you. And right now in the presence of God, he continues to pray for you. And listen to how these petitions are described. This is so great. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 11 on, he writes, For he, Jesus, who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. Saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Think about that picture. That Jesus unashamedly calls us brothers and sisters to the Father. It's as if in the sanctuary, Jesus proudly wears the names of his brothers and sisters on his chest. Just like the Old Testament high priest. And he advocates for us. Saying, behold, I and the children God has given me. In other words, behold, these are my brothers. These are my sisters. And he intercedes. He advocates for you. And for me, even today. And this should do a couple things for us. Obviously, I think, first of all, it should challenge us. It should challenge us. Because I think so often, like Peter, it's really easy to think of our faith and our commitment. It's just all by our, we're on our own. In it. It's all by our own strength. By our own maturity and faith. That maybe even though Jesus gave us faith when we first believed, somehow we're kind of like the ones who are to maintain that faith. As if Jesus kind of like, you know, maybe gave us a little nudge in the right direction, but we just got to keep our legs moving. Um, I'm not a runner. That might surprise many of you, but I'm not a runner. But I have run a 5K, and it was a terrible experience. Um, But I signed up for this 5K because a group from my church, friends, decided to go do it. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a piece of cake. 5K, that's like, what, three miles? I can do that any day of the week. Um, So I didn't train at all. I didn't run one day before race day. And so I showed up, I had the t-shirt on, I had my shoes laced, and I was like, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm as ready as anybody that's here. Let's, let's run this race. And so the race started, and we were going, and I was feeling really good. Um, like, this is a little embarrassing, but, but like, I, there was a point at the beginning that I even like ran backwards and like waved at my friends, like, yeah, we're good, I'll see you at the end. Um, and the race kept going. And it kept going, and it kept going. Three miles is longer than I thought it was. But literally, I was like dry heaving at the end of the race. I don't run anymore. But, but I just felt like I got this. I mean, I'm equipped for this. I can do it. And I think that sometimes we, we view salvation this way a little bit. That, that I got this. You know, Jesus started me out, but I can face temptation. I can acknowledge his name. In any room, with anybody. I can do any of that. But, but here's what happens. If you think that, you're going to end up like Peter. You're going to be in danger of either becoming very prideful of your spiritual maturity. Or then you're going to be incredibly discouraged when you fail. Right? Like it's really easy to make promises. It's really easy to make vows to demonstrate our commitment. But listen, we ought to do that with humility. Jesus is the one who saved you. And he's the one who sustains you. But because his work is perfect, you will be saved. Like understand, Jesus is a much better savior than you are. He's a little more qualified. right? So to try and exalt your own faith is is really to steal glory from the one who gave it to you. To steal glory from the one who sustains it for you. And so understand that Jesus' intercessory ministry really, really challenges our self-confident spirituality. And we have to say, no, I'm here only because of Jesus. Back that first day that I believed, and today because I believe. But Jesus' intercessory work should comfort us as well. 
Because again, our tendency is to have feeble and weak faith, but it's not a surprise to Jesus. Right? Like he would not be praying for you if he didn't know that you needed it. And the good news of the gospel is that when we deny the Lord, he's gracious to forgive us. He's gracious to cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we repent and come to him, even in the most shameful of betrayals, just like Peter's, because Jesus will not lose any of his own. Another C.S. Lewis classic, uh, his Chronicles of Narnia, that's probably more well known. Uh, You've probably read it or at least watched the movies. And in this series, he tells the, the fictional story of, of these siblings who enter into the land of Narnia uh, through a magical wardrobe. And, and, and one of the, probably the most popular book in the series, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The, the story is told of, of how they come into Narnia and, and they discover that this land has been taken over by the evil white witch. However, the people of Narnia are, are expectant. They believed that one day Aslan, the lion, he's going to come back. And he's going to make all things right again. That winter will fade away and summer will come back. Well, in the story, I don't know if you remember this part, but, but one of the boys, Edmund, he's tricked into following the evil white witch. And, and so the siblings tell Aslan when he comes back and Aslan does his thing and And he frees Edmund. He redeems Edmund from under the white witch. And there's this great scene, this chapter, where the white witch comes to visit Aslan's camp. And when she's there, she points to Edmund. Points him out and makes an accusation. And this is what Lewis wrote about that scene. He said, you have a traitor there, Aslan, said the witch. Of course, everyone present knew that she meant Edmund. But Edmund had got past thinking about himself after all he'd been through. And after the talk he'd had that morning, he just went on looking at Aslan. It didn't seem to matter what the witch said. It's a great picture. Trying to convey this truth that that the Lord is faithful to forgive. The Lord is faithful and gracious to cleanse us. He's ready to restore us just like he does to Peter in John 21. When we repent, we just keep looking to Jesus. And it no longer matters what the accuser demands, it no longer matters what he desires. Jesus has the final word. In Hebrews chapter 12, he, he, he would say, we run this race with endurance, so, so that's true, we need to do that. But while we do that, we look to Jesus. He's described as the author and perfecter of our faith. So we follow Jesus. We're as committed as we possibly can be. But we know and we believe. Our ultimate preservation is due not to our own strength, but to the strength of Christ. That he's gracious high priest, a strong and sure savior. So listen, let's look to him. Let's look to him in faith. Let's rest in his finished work on the cross, but listen, let's also rest in his continued work in heaven. Can we do that? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the day today. God, thank you again for an opportunity to open your word, um, to be confronted with it, to be challenged by it, but ultimately for it to point us to you. God, we're grateful, Lord, that you gave us a word that, that doesn't hide the hard, difficult parts of life, that is very honest about the people within its pages. And so, Father, as we read this section of Peter, Lord, we admit that we relate to him so well. Lord, we want to make the vow. We want to make the commitment. We want to be strong in our faith but we recognize we don't hold it very often. So, Father, we're thankful for your grace. God, we're reminded of some important truths this morning, Lord, that that, that Satan is real and he desires us. Father, would you guard us from the evil one? Would you preserve our faith today? Father, I pray you would also embolden our faith at our campfires, Lord, at the office and at school and the neighborhood or within your house and within the homes. Father, I pray that we're faithful witnesses to you. God, we thank you that you have continued your, uh, Jesus, that you've continued your ministry of, of intercession. That we have the Holy Spirit as an advocate here and that Jesus is our advocate there. Father, we thank you for our faith. Lord, we thank you for being faithful even when we're not faithful. God, it's our prayer as always this morning. If there's someone here that doesn't know you, Father, would you draw them to yourself? Would you give them faith today? Father, for those of us who you've done that to, would you strengthen our faith? God, we rest in your finished work on the cross and what you do each and every day for us. 
Father, we pray for your blessing as we continue in worship this morning. Would you be exalted and glorified? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.